Bienvenidas, bienvenidos, bienvenides a otro de los eventos de esta 36 sexta edición del Festival de Cine de Mar del Plata. En este caso, una charla con maestros. Con maestro, con un maestro puntual y específico, el señor Phil Tippett. ¿Quién es Phil Tippett? Seguramente conocen su trabajo porque han visto y los ha perseguido durante toda su vida, desde que han visto eh, algunas de las películas en las que formó parte, el listado es inmenso, pero entre otros trabajos ha hecho cositas como eh, Star Wars, como Jurassic Park, como Robocop, como Starship Troopers, y ahora nos eh, llena de alegría poder decir que también Mad God, un largometraje que forma parte de esta 36 sexta edición del festival, que nos llena de alegría porque es un trabajo de pasión de Phil, vamos a hablar mucho sobre esto y sobre su obra como animador y especialista en efectos especiales, alguien que viene trabajando desde hace mucho y que trabajó con muchos amigos del festival. Un placer poder eh, contar con tu presencia, Phil, muchas gracias por esta charla. Yeah, the pleasure is mine. Excellent. Excelente. Bueno, eh, vamos a hablar un poco con la ayuda de nuestros intérpretes, Emilia y Alejo, vamos a hablar un poco sobre la carrera de, de, de alguien que hizo mucho por la animación, que eh, creo que tiene un, un punto de partida hermoso y romántico asociado a la cinefilia, y que sin lugar a duda, cuando alguien eh, trabaja desde ese lugar, no puede más que causar lo mismo sobre los demás. Eh, seguramente mucha gente a futuro, si no ya eh, gente que trabaja, y seguramente gente que trabaja con vos, Phil, ya lo debe decir, se vieron influenciados por tu obra y se dedicaron a hacer cine y a dedicarse puntualmente a la animación eh, por, por, por trabajos como los que hiciste. Contanos un poco cómo llegás vos a la animación. In 1956, I was five years old, and um, I just happened to see King Kong. Someone was playing King Kong on the television, very small screen, black and white. Well, King Kong's in black and white. And um, so that was the very first thing that um, I saw that uh, it, it was like magic. And that got me interested in dinosaurs. And so I studied dinosaurs from the age of five, you know, and drew pictures of dinosaurs and all kinds of things, you know, robots and giant squids and monsters. And, um, and then in 1958, uh, Ray Harryhausen, The Seven Voyage of Sinbad came on and that, To me, by that time, I was seven years old, and it was like being hit by a bolt of lightning. And I had no idea how the work was done, uh, but it was magic. And, you know, that's followed me through my career. It was just, uh, that's what I wanted to see, was magical stuff, you know. And I've been very lucky to be able to, you know, to do that Y, y nosotros también, eh, esto, la influencia de Harryhausen eh, es universal, eh, Harryhausen es, es un verdadero maestro, pero lo bueno de los maestros, y quiero llevarte hacia ese lugar a vos, eh, como alguien que, que, que también forma parte de ese panteón, es que no solo eh, influencian con su obra, sino que llevan más allá la, la, la construcción, y es el caso de lo que sucede con tu obra a través de eh, la creación del Go Motion, que es otra forma de trabajar con el, el Stop Motion o la animación cuadro a cuadro. Eh, este trabajo eh, surge a, a partir de, de años de práctica. ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo empezás en la animación? Porque, sin lugar a duda, esto no es algo que se empieza en las grandes ligas, ¿no? Yeah, well, let's see. Um, uh, uh, you know, the you know there were there was no information about um, any of this stuff. You know, uh, but there was one periodical, uh, Warren publication, uh, with the editor um, um, 
uh, for a Ackerman. And he was very influential uh, in my life in that, um, well, the famous monsters first gave me the indication of how it was done because he was a friend of Ray Harryhausen's and he published articles about the process and Ray and, you know, uh, the, they were very informative and some, you know, some pretty in depth. Ray was always very secretive about his work and how it was accomplished. But the general principles were, you know, at least available. And then, you know, later on, uh, I, I was living uh, about 100 miles away from Los Angeles. So uh, when I was able, well, uh, yeah, and I was working with a, another you know, older filmmaker and we were making a, a um, short version of Ray Bradbury's Sound of Thunder. So uh, Forey would invite us up to, uh, his house, the Acker Mansion, which was a museum that had all the King Kong puppets and Mighty Joe Young, and Ray had, um, you know, given him some props from his movies, and that's where I read, met Ray. And I think about 1967 or eight, when I was like 16 years old, and uh, so I, I, you know, when I was about say 12. I earned money by doing yard work and saved up enough money to, to buy a stop motion camera and just started practicing, you know, with clay and, and whatever. And uh, about that time, these posable uh, models, uh, GI Joes came out that were all articulated. So, you know, that was something that was a little bit more, um, you know, solid than the clay that I, I could work with. And I just practiced and practiced and practiced. And it was a vertical climb because, you know, I didn't have any of the, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of equipment that you have today. So I would just, it would take me months to shoot a, a roll of eight millimeter film and I'd have to send it to New York and in two weeks, get it back and look at what I did. And it was like, it was like, if you can imagine um, playing the, p trying to learn how to play the piano and not hearing it and then hearing it two weeks later and trying to figure out what you did. So it was a very slow and gradual evolution, you know, to get to the point where I could do anything that I thought was even acceptable. Probably not until my 20s. Y ahí nace un, un arte que creo que, que llegaste a desarrollar muchísimo y, y a expandir con los años, que, que es el arte de la escultura. Eh, aunque, aunque no seas, eh, de, no te dediques a la escultura en sí como, como arte, eh, si lo haces con, con tus diseños. Y siempre me pregunto cuando veo a un artista, ¿cómo es llegar a la obra en sí? O sea, ¿cuál es el punto de partida? En tu, en tu trabajo has hecho millones, seguramente, de, 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 de figuras eh, con, con, con cerámica, con plastilina, con distintos materiales. ¿Cómo es ese trabajo de, de escultura para llegar a la pieza que buscas? Well, en an interview uh, with Pablo Picasso, he... Um was asked what, what he was trying to do or what he was seeking in his paintings. And uh, he said, I do not seek, I find. And that's, that's what I did. You know, I usually approach things with, um, well, also, if you look back at um, the equivalent of interviews with, uh, you know, Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven, um, they just said they copied the music and it came down from God. And it's a very similar process. I actually don't think while I'm doing stuff, you know, I just, you know, kind of listen. I mean, when you're doing uh, theatrical feature films, of course, there's an objective that you have to hit. And, you know, if George Lucas wants a, you know, rank or, or a Jabba or, or Verhoeven wants a, 
bug or a uh, you know robot, then you know you have a starting point, and then you just design from from that. And you you do a number. Uh, actually, you know, with George, he always accepted uh, what I did uh, pretty much the first time. You know, so uh, it, it was actually very easy, and I we. I worked with a bunch of people that I started working professionally at a, uh, a commercial studio that was really quite big in Hollywood, uh, at Seward and Romaine in Hollywood. And it was a big production house with the sound stages and, and mixing and editorial. And um, there was a, the um, insert stage was the special effects stage, stage six. And that's was was pretty much my you know um graduate uh program education you know because you got to learn a lot of things about you know not just animation but everything you know um from shooting to building props and building sets you know on a schedule and the turnover was really quick so you got to learn a lot of stuff very quickly and then, you know, from there, you know, that's where I met uh, Dennis Muir and Ken Ralston, John Berg and Tom Santamon, guys that I worked with. And, and we're all friends. So I, got, I you know, uh, Dennis and Ken got hired on Star Wars. And then, you know, that was the link when George wanted to shoot some more material for the cantina. Um, we worked uh, under Rick Baker. And there were about four of us out of work stop motion animators. And so we made those characters and then we played them. George invited us down to the stage uh, to shoot them. And while we were working on it, uh, George saw one of the stop motion puppets that I made when I was about, you know, 15 or 16 years old and asked, uh, um, well, Michael Crichton had just come out with Future World, and in it was a hologram. And George was like, he was just going to put the monster um, outfits on, uh, you know, like a blacked out stage and double expose them into the picture. And he saw, you know, stop motion gave him the idea to do the chess set as stop motion. And it was right at the end of the schedule. And John Berg and I had about two weeks so uh, we asked him what he wanted, and he said, you know, make me, you know, uh, a dozen space aliens. You know, so we, we fabricated, you know, we just made the stuff up. You know, there was no uh, process of you know, showing George and then doing iterations. It was just, just do it. And that's pretty much what he did, you know, uh, all the time, you know. Uh, with me. I mean, he pretty much operated kind of like a documentary filmmaker, whereas, well, I just want to see the stuff and then I'll figure out what it is, you know? And so, for instance, Admiral Akbar, you know, every once a week, well, uh, for, let's see, Return of the Jedi, um, I headed up the creature department. And, um, and, uh, I had about three or four sculptors working with me. And at the end of the week, uh, George would come in and look at what we had done. And some he'd go, well, not that, not this. You know, this will be um, the singer and this will play the, uh, the piano. And this is uh, Admiral Akbar. And uh, he, he said, uh, what, is, what is that? And I said, uh, it's a calamari man. And so I guess that's how it got its name. <laughs> Pero, o sea, hubo un trabajo de, 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 de Lucas de darle libertad creativa, que es algo sin lugar a duda bienvenido por cualquier artista, pero partiendo de la base de, de, de todo un trabajo de realización, que eh, como bien decías, eh, requiere también de, de, de conocimientos previos, que son muchos los que fuiste adquiriendo mientras trabajabas en, en comerciales, en distintos proyectos, pero también requiere mucho estudio propio, ¿no? Hay mucho estudio de anatomía, de la anatomía de los insectos, inclusive a lo largo de tu obra, la construcción de, de, de series eh, 
de otros planetas, otras dimensiones, etc. Tiene mucho de eso, de, de, de un estudio cuidadoso de, de, de la anatomía universal, si se quiere. Yeah, well, I'm not formally trained at all. I'm, I'm self-taught. And uh, yeah, I would do that. I would do um, lots of, you know, since I, you know, was like, you know, 12 years old, or, you know, uh, well, let's say 16. You know, I would do, do a lot of drawings. I had a lot of anatomy books, a lot of books on animals and, you know, Would, would sculpt and at some point became a, you know, just by trial and error, profi uh, proficient at, at doing it. And then, of course, animation was a lot slower, you know, of, of uh, getting to a point that was acceptable. But um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what happened. Y ahí surge esta necesidad desde tu lado que, que me gustaría que nos cuentes brevemente de, de, de qué se trata de, 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 de despegarte de, de, las, de la gran clásica escuela de la animación clásica eh, para, para crear el Go Motion, que es una, una variación que moderniza un poco el, el sistema de animación. Contanos un poco de qué se trata, por favor. Well, I was never really a fan of animation, you know. Um, you know, I, I, I and cell animation, I didn't particularly care for. I'm, I'm more of a, you know, I have more of a three dimensional mind, and you know, so it's, it's pretty much the content of the material that you know um, will get me interested, like you know, Tex Avery or. You know, the, you know, early Popeye films or Betty Boop or, or whatever, you know, were interesting, you know, because, um, you know, these were made by adults that, you know, were somewhat misanthropic and still had like a really great sense of humor. Um, But but then I only I only particularly cared for you know the Willis O'Brien and, and Ray Harryhausen and uh, and uh, stop motion animation within that context and, and so I had a very very narrow focus. Y, y el, el go motion cómo nace? When Dennis and Ken were working on Star Wars uh, uh, before I was hired, uh, I would, uh, they were on the night crew shooting the uh, descent into the Death Star. And I would come by for um, dinner and uh, um, that's where I saw the motion control equipment working. And, you know, it was just like, As soon as I saw it, I, I realized, and I think we all kind of realized this at the same time, um, throughout the history of stop motion, um, animators have tried to put blurs on the um, stop motion characters because the stop motion characters, as a result of being single frames, still frames were very clear and that tended to make them appear a, a little bit stuttery. And uh, so um, uh, Ladislav Sterovich uh, tried some experiments with um, blurring his puppets. And, and they were adequate because they, they were um, uh, puppet films, you know. Uh, Jim Danforth tried to do it in When Dinosaurs Ruled the Earth with this pterodactyl type thing. And what he did was he would um, have the pterodactyl hanging on wires and he would just hit it. And, and while the camera was exposing, uh, you would get a blur, but it looked kind of funky. You know, it kind of looked like a universal Dracula bat, you know. Uh, yeah, it was, it was odd. And so, you know, the, you know, if we could hook up a stop motion puppet to the motion control uh, devices, um, well, would that work? And so as soon as we moved up to uh, 
uh, Northern California to work on Empire, Ken Ralston and I hooked up a puppet that I had that I had made um, because we didn't have any other stop motion puppets, but it was a puppet that I made for um, Joe Dante and John Davison's Piranha. And um, so we hooked that up to the Go, Go Motion and, um, and sh one afternoon shot a number of tests and looked at it the next day in dailies and it worked. And so, um, you know, and, and the way it works is that the camera, um, uh, as the puppet is moving, the, the shutter on the camera opens and the uh, camera records the puppet moving uh, in a single frame in space, but you get a, the characteristic motion blur. And uh, yeah, it just worked. And so, you know, that's how we did the Tauntaun. And later on, we developed a much more sophisticated, um, kind of a, like a bon, bon computerized Boomer Coup puppet for, for Dragon Slayer. And uh, pretty much used that uh, until um, computer graphic, you know, animation. Exactly. Go Motion se transformó en, en, en una técnica, un sistema utilizado todas las producciones de pequeñas a grandes porque la sensación de movimiento es mayor y eso es un, un, un gran avance para, para la animación este, sin lugar a duda eh, hablaste un yeah. poco de Piraña de la película de Joe Dante película que lo tuvimos de invitado a Joe Dante dimos Piraña y pudimos verte flotando ahí como un cadáver víctima de las pirañas ¿no es así? ya yeah. Yeah, so Joe and I would, um, you know, Joe wanted to see me eaten by, you know, the monsters, that uh, the pir piranha fish that I had designed. So, you know, uh, it's Joe and me are the scuba divers that go down and, uh, you know, are, are looking around for, I forget what we were looking for. And, uh, yeah, I get attacked by, you know, my creations. And Joe thought that was amusing. Clásico show Dante, sin lugar a dudas. Eh, eh, hay, hay well, and then Joe also, and John Davison are big fans of stop motion. And um, they found, they scraped together just enough money, you know, for me to make a uh, stop motion character that showed up in a you know, half dozen shots, you know, in the movie. Claro, exactamente. Hay, hay una, una criatura por ahí dando vueltas que es también trabajo tuyo. Eh, hay mucho de lúdico en tu, en tu tarea y, 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 y supongo que es algo de lo que, de lo que te... Si, si podés distanciarte del seguramente durísimo trabajo que haces, eh, lo lúdico está presente todo el tiempo y, y la posibilidad de experimentar y de ampliar horizontes y dejar que tu mente fluya, que de eso se trata Mad God, absolutamente, de dejarte llevar, supongo, canalizar eh, cuestiones oníricas y, 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 y toda la, la, la cultura que tenés adentro, eh, todos lo, lo, los estudios, las lecturas y todo, eh, llevarlos para ese lado. ¿Cuánto de lo lúdico forma parte de tu día a día? Well, it's all play. It, it was, I, I approach it no differently than I did when I was a child. And I, um, in, in the 50s, um, um, there was a company, Marks, that made these play sets. And they were pretty cheap, you know? And so my parents would get them for me for birthday or Christmas, and one would be a dinosaur and caveman, and the other one would be cowboys and Indians, and the other would be, you know, World War II characters. And, uh, and so that was my training ground, really, for coming up with scenarios and imagining things. I, I you know, I pretty much just did that. I had run one track mind. I had friends and, you know, played with them, but I, I spent most of my time um, trying to figure this stuff out and uh, and um, 
yeah, I mean that 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 and the the need to uh, see something I've never seen before, you know, really kind of drove me. And I get bored with stuff and just want to move on. So you know, I got tired of space aliens, and I got tired of you know robots, and I got tired of dinosaurs, and you know, so you know, I I just was you know wanted to move on to the next thing. Y lo siguiente, después de crear personajes como Java, Ak, el, el, el señor Akbar, el Calamar y, y, y demás eh, personajes que, que, que han poblado el universo de, de, de Star Wars, eh, desde el, el, el juego de ajedrez en adelante, eh, el siguiente paso fue Dragon Slayer, en el cual pudiste darte el gusto de, de animar un, un dragón, y después, entre otras cosas, porque no vamos a enumerar todas, no vamos a hablar de Howard the Duck, de Dinosaur, o Indiana Jones, que tuviste también alguna, estuviste involucrado allí, llega eh, Robocop, que es tu primer trabajo con eh, el señor Verhoeven, un director que me parece que termina siendo un amigo, ¿no? Sí. Yes. ¿Cómo yeah. fue el trabajo en Robocop y cómo, cómo empezaron a relacionarse con él? Uh, well, in general, kind of as an overview, um, uh, what Paul needed from me in, in his movies was... Um, Uh, he he would you know metaphorically uh, look at it uh, as if he was the conductor of a symphony orchestra and uh, I was the first violin and we were playing a violin concerto. Uh, he would make sure that I got everything that I needed, you know, not to make him look good, but to do the best performance possible. And all the great directors did that. You know, um, there are less great directors that we in the industry called FIDS, F-I-D-S, FID, which stands for fucking idiot director. And, and luckily I haven't had to work with many of those, but I have, you know. <laughs> Supongo que llevas una vida tratando de evitar entrar en esa categoría. Por favor, decime que nunca entraste ahí. Oh, no. Well, not to my face. Eso es bueno. Es un buen comienzo. En Robocop haces eh, tu, un trabajo que, que, que te permite también eh, meterte dejar de lado los, los alienígenas y, y, y los monstruos, y te metes con la tecnología y empezás a trabajar en ese proyecto hermoso que es el ED-209-209, eh, el, el enemigo número uno de, de Robocop. Eh, ¿Cómo fue trabajar en ese proyecto? Con, con pasar a la tecnología, ¿no? Quiero decir, dejar... dejar eh, lo orgánico y pasar a lo metálico. Well, it was just a job, you know, and, and Paul uh, had never worked with visual effects, so he relied on me a great deal to um, help him understand the stuff. And I'm, I'm good at doing organic things but i'm i'm terrible at doing mechanical things and i was really lucky on return of the jedi uh one of the guys in the costume department as we were making all the the uh job is throne worm room uh characters uh would have barbecues in the afternoon and i met this kid craig hayes who is probably the only person that I would call a genius that I ever worked with. And I just hired him, you know, and it was his first movie that he, that he, he'd worked on and he 
couldn't be. He was, you know, barely 20. Uh, but he was just, you know, masterful. And so I brought Craig down and we had our first meetings with Paul and, uh, you know, Craig designed Ed 209 and was very, you know, uh, built the full scale prop and um, the stop motion characters. And um, Tom Sandman and Blair Clark, Clark made the stop motion armatures. But, you know, how the process uh, evolves du du during a movie, as an example, um, on Robocop. Uh, the boardroom scene where Ed 209 is introduced, I, um, we had a problem uh, in that um, the way the scene needed to be structured, uh, it, um, it, it could have called for blue screen shots, which would mean shooting all the backgrounds uh, on location and then putting in the, the puppet. However, uh, you know, Ronnie Cox had to, had to do a, a, you know, a very long um, speech standing in front of Ed 209. And, and it would have just looked terrible to have to do it with blue screen and mats and all that. So I proposed to Paul, and this was pretty much, you know, I, I would, when we got stuck, I would come up with a solution on, you know, both troopers or, you know, RoboCop and this particular one that I pitched to Paul was uh, that we make a, a full scale prop for Ed 209. Uh, and just like they did in, in King Kong or, you know, other movies, Jurassic Park, you, um, you have the stop motion puppet for the ambulatory scenes and it worked out perfectly for Ed 209. And that, you know, if we could, if we could just wheel in this, this prop Ed 209, then Ronnie Cox can deliver his speech. And uh, I propose that uh, as he's standing there that we keep it alive by a uh, very bass pedal note low tone so it's kind of like his voice in a way and uh so i pitched that to paul and he went sure and <laughs> and th and that's how it goes <laughs> that's how it was working with paul a lot if if you were able to be logical it was like yeah why not of course i should have thought of that <laughs> excellent antes de, de hacer Robocop, igual, eh, en 1985, haces esa genialidad llamada Prehistoric Beast, que es un cortometraje que dirigiste, que, que se restauró recientemente, eh, que es delicioso en cuanto a los tiempos, es muy cuidadoso acerca de todo lo que tiene que ver con, con la ambientación, y ni que hablar con, con los... los los animales, los monstruos, los dinosaurios. ¿Fue esa una forma de despedirte del universo de dinosaurios? ¿O crees que va a seguir estando presente en vos trabajar con dinosaurios? Well, I hope not. I mean, I'm, I'm done with the dinosaurs. And that was what prehistoric beast was intended to be, you know, until Jurassic Park. But... Um, Uh, so, uh, yeah, I made Prehistoric Beast uh, as a, um, you know, kind of a documentary style thing. And, uh, and yeah, I just wanted to put a nail in that coffin and say goodbye to dinosaurs and, and move on. And uh, so you know, that's, you know, pretty much what I, I did. You know, my my wife uh, edited the movie, but it's animation, so editing is more like just you know dropping things in. But she also went out and recorded all the sounds and did all the sound effects, and um, and so it was really done on a shoestring. I took a year off after Return of the Jedi and made Prehistoric Beasts pretty much by myself. I had one student assistant that helped me. 
Uh, and, you know, it took about a year to, to you know, finish up. El, resu el resultado es buenísimo, sobre todo porque podemos ver tu, tu voz autoral eh, dentro de, de, de es, esa búsqueda, digo, ar armar esa construcción de clima, de sensación, eh, el enfrentamiento entre el, los monstruos, o dinosaurios, que es también con, con muchas cosas muy innovadoras, la forma en que está filmada, y es, es sin lugar a duda, eh, un, un buen canto de cisne para tu trabajo con dinosaurios, hasta que aparece Spielberg y un quiebre en tu carrera, eh, que es Jurassic Park, que te obliga a, a, a cambiar tu forma de trabajo, ¿no? Contanos un poco cómo fue el pasar a, 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 la, a otra forma de animación. Well, technology changes everything. And uh, so it was no different. Well, it was different. I mean, with the go motion, you know, I was very heavily involved with the, the you know, implementation of, of <clears throat> and the design of the go motion system. I, I didn't do any in, of the engineering or all any of that kind of stuff, but I would just guide in terms of, you know, what my requirements were. And then uh, when uh, the computer graphic uh, revolution hit, um, I was dismayed. I, I was, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I got sick and uh, I, I got, I had pneumonia and my doctor made me uh, stay in bed. Uh, Because initially we were going to do it conventionally with go motion and high speed puppets, and then uh, ILM proved that it was possible to do it as a computer graphic. And I thought my world, you know, had come to an end. But that was not the case. I mean, that was a very pivotal point in my my journey. And that uh, now I've been kicked upstairs as more of a supervisor. And I would have never, you know, if I had to work on a computer, I I would have found another job. I would have worked in a shoe store, a pizza parlor. And um, because that's, you know, I, I, I just need to move in space and, and touch things. But, you know, I, I've worked a lot um, in the um, early 70s. Uh, the Vietnam War was going. And I was not going to go over and fight in Vietnam, uh, but I was able to get a student deferment. And I went to UC Irvine uh, in California. And uh, that was at the very beginning of uh, the conceptual art movement. And so uh, my instructors were uh, Bastian Otter and Mike Asher and um, via Selmans, and uh, they, they were some of the very early, um, they were probably in their mid-30s at that time. They were like young artists and, you know, pretty much unknown, but they were at the forefront of conceptual art. And, you know, you, you look back, they're still writing articles about those guys as being the, you know, very pivotal and formative moments of conceptual art, but understanding that Um, that you didn't need to work within the classical framework of sculpture and painting and drawing, that the concept was, that's where the art was. And then you could do anything to uh, illustrate that concept, anything, you know, uh, using sticks or rocks or, you know, uh, huge earthworks outdoors or, you know, you know, video um, or, you know, growing plants, you know, it was just like anything. And so that was, that was very pivotal for me in that there was, everything always had to come with a concept first, you know, and I, I can find concepts pretty quickly, you know. I mean, when you're asked to do, you know, like a, a rancor you know george would say well i need this big monster that lives in the basement of java's palace and uh and so i like yeah okay um 
And the concept I came up with was a cross between a bear and a potato. And so that was, that was my guide. You know, it's like eh, something <laughs> like that. And then, then when, when uh, I was designing uh, Java, I did about three or four. Jo George responded very well to three-dimensional maquettes, you know, because he could hold them up and he could see them in light and he could totally imagine, you know, how they would drop into his movie. And, um, but on Jabba, uh, I'd done about three or four uh, little, you know, sculpting the cats. Uh, and you go like, well, that one looks too much like Ming the Merciless and that one's too horrible. And, and this one, uh, whatever. And so we we're at like kind of a, um, you know, impasse. And so I asked him, um, if you could choose any actor uh, in history, film history, to play Jabba, who would that be? And he said, Sydney Greenstreet. And it was just like, okay, now I get it. Now I know what to do. But I had, that's the same thing as a concept, right? You just need like a coat hanger that, you know, hang your outfit on. Perfecto. Y ahí aparecen de nuevo los, los tiranosauros y, y, y demás eh, animales en tu vida. Eh, pero este lugar, esta vez, como bien decís, como supervisor, algo que seguiste haciendo y, y, y trabajando eh, cerca de la franquicia eh, de Jurassic Park, Jurassic World, etc. Eh, y en el medio, entre estas películas, apareció Paul Verhoeven nuevamente eh, con otro proyecto que requería una monstruosidad de trabajo, monstruosidad por el tamaño de, y las implicancias, y monstruosidad porque iba a haber muchos monstruos en juego, y eh, así es como llega Starship Troopers, una película en la que supongo no se podría haber hecho eh, a ese nivel eh, en, en otro tipo de animación, ¿no? ¿Cómo fue ese trabajo? Arduo, además de arduo, por supuesto. Well, it wasn't only hard. I mean, I had no idea how to do it, how to pull that off. You know, it was just like, it was overwhelming, you know, and... My company's only experience uh, up to that point was Jurassic Park, and and ILM did all the heavy lifting on that. We we did the animation for the the key scenes with the raptor in the kitchen in the Tyrannosaurus paddock, but um, you know they did all of the rendering and compositing and all that stuff. So now um, it was our task, you know, because I was, I was attached to Paul's contract in that uh, he would refuse to do the movie unless I could do the bugs. And so, yeah, I, you know, I, I didn't know what to do. I mean, fortunately, I had Craig Hayes uh, and my wife, Jules Roman, was the producer. And, um, but you know, I was supposed to supervise the thing. And I, I really had no idea how to do it. I mean, fortunately, I could lean on Craig a lot, uh, who he designed all of the bugs. And um, uh, so I was, I was stuck. I was at, I, I, I had hit a brick wall and um, didn't know what to do. And I had a dream one night in while we were doing pre-production. And in the dream, I had a long piece of bamboo that was like 20 feet long or 18 feet long. And from that, there was uh, these macrame seats that Alan Marshall and uh, John Davison, the producers, sat in. And then I would have to get in the middle of the thing and lift it up and walk up a precipitous path that was no bigger than that with a 4,000 foot drop into a churning ocean you know, with you know, waves breaking on rocks. And I have a tremendous fear of heights. 
and and so I'm I'm walking up this this you know really steep rise with these two producers, and I get to this point where it's like a it's like a ninety degree turn, and it was like I can't do this, and you know the voice in my head said, but you have to do it, but I can't do it, but you have to do it, but I can't do it. And the solution that I came up with was um, one step at a time. You don't think about the step you're going to take next or the one you've just taken. You only focus on the step you're taking. That's how I did it. I mean, simple, but it was like, and I guess that's what I always did. You know, but in this context, you know, it was the, the only thing. That, I mean, I already knew it, but intuitively, but I never thought about it before. Un poco el, ese paso a paso y que cada uno de ellos sea firme, define tu carrera como, como cineasta y como autor. Eh, es, es, es muy difícil en el mundo en el que vivimos eh, señalar quienes separar los autores de, 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 de la gente que hace trabajos de manera apta, pero la suma de creaciones de universos en la que estuviste involucrado te, te, te lleva a, esa, a ese lugar, al lugar de autoría, y, y ese sueño que acabas de contar deriva clara y concretamente en Mad God. De alguna forma, Mad God es la película de Mad, Mad, Mad God. Mad God. ¿Qué fue la pregunta? Mad God es una película que, 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 que te lleva a ese precipicio constantemente. Una película que te llevó mucho tiempo y tuvo distintas versiones hasta llegar a ser lo que es. Eh, Saltamos hacia ahí, eh, si te parece. En realidad nombramos que en el medio hiciste también eh, como director Starship Troopers 2, Hero of the Federation, una película del 2004 que fue volver a ese universo que te traía pesadillas, eh, pero desplegarlo con otra, con otra seguridad después de haber hecho la primera, ¿no? Uh, try that again. I didn't completely understand. No, bueno, hablamos un poquito del de fin de Starship Troopers y de la, la segunda eh, parte de la película, que esta vez te tocó dirigir. What? Starship yeah. Troopers For, for that, I mean, that was more of a thing uh, that John Davison pushed. I, I was never that interested in directing live action because I'd worked with these directors and I could see, you know, the kind of work that they had to do and the kind of mind that you had to have to, to do that. And I just didn't have that, you know. And, you know, I, I was... I was interested in it and it certainly learned a lot. And, you know, uh, you know, Paul has said in, in interviews that there were three directors on Starship Troopers. There was uh, himself and second unit director, Vic Armstrong, and there was me. And uh, yeah, so it, it was a lot of stuff that, that I had done that was directorial, you know, in that movie, you know, and you know, again, like Paul would lean on me and, you know, and when things got stuck or if I came up with a better idea, you know, it was like, then the director would do my idea, you know? And uh, so, you know, I had a lot of experience doing that, but, you know, I really preferred, um, you know, I've kind of got a Garrett mentality I just like to kind of shut myself away and, and push the world out of the way. And, you know, a lot of the, uh, my process is I had, a, I had a German guy, very young, in, in his very early 20s, 
who came over and I, I met him at a um, at some kind of a big festival seminar in uh, Germany. And uh, he was smart and he was like pretty talented. His name was Arnie. And so Arnie came over, got a visa and worked with me on that guy for about eight months and turned into a pretty good animator, you know? And, um, and so uh, as an example, uh, if we were to set up a shot, uh, he would ask me what my intention was, you know, for the shot. It was like I had some idea, but, you know, I didn't really know, you know. Uh, you know, I was not seeking, I needed to find. And so, you know, I'd tell Arnie, he'd say, what, what's the concept? And I go like, well, the concept is uh, bring a table over here. Stop motion table. And he goes, okay, so uh, now what is the concept for the shot? Well, the concept for the shot is get a camera. And so I just go through that. Uh, and it's like, yeah, but uh, you know, uh, get the lights, get the puppets, put the puppets in, get some props. Here's the set, and let's move the set around. And um, we found it. You know, we would just find. And and Mad God was uh, definitely a project that was not uh, that was not um, did not come from intention. You know, I I was a pretty prolific dreamer. And, and certainly on Mad God, I filled up volumes and volumes and volumes of like these big books of, of dreams. And my dreams were always kind of, you know, like everybody else's hit and miss. And, you know, uh, you know, you know, like people say, oh, this is, it was really weird. And I can't remember all of it, but all of my dreams were, were had a narrative structure to them. And that's what I was looking for was an unconscious way or, or that, that's how these um, diaries, these dream diaries work for me because I, I would study them and look at how the narrative structure of the dreams work. And they were a narrative structure, but they weren't you know, classical, you know, uh, you know, beginning, middle, and end, three act structure. Uh, and so that, that was kind of my, my compass, my guide for, for making that God. And, um, and, uh, and then when Mad God was over, those dreams stopped. They, they just happened while I was working on Mad God. And um, while, uh, you know, um, Mad God actually destroyed me. And uh, it, um, I ended up having a, um, an emotional breakdown and, and went into a psychiatric ward for a while. And it took me months to recover from it. But it was, it was actually a very slow descent that I, I hadn't, noticed but my friends had where you know I, I just kind of gradually ended up looking like a street person you know like you know my hair was the you know, beard was, I just let it go and my clothes were all ripped up and spattered with paint and my hands were heavily bandaged from knocking it against um, you know building sets and, and things like that and uh, so, and then I, I hated working on Mad God for the last, you know, couple of years. It was just like getting behind the mule and plowing the field. I just had to force myself to do it. And, um, and I'm glad I did it. You know, I would never do it again, but it was a religious experience. And, um, I was guided by something other than me doing it. And um, I channeled something, but I don't know what it was. And uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, 
uh, the West Coast premiere um, uh, happened uh, at the Beyond Fest in Los Angeles. And, you know, afterwards, you know, lines of people wanting autographs. And there was this older gentleman, older than me by, you know, I don't know, he must have been in his 80s. And he was nicely dressed. And he was some kind of a professor. I forget. I should have gotten his card or number or something. But um, he was a he was like a polymath. He was into, you know, like everything, but, you know, architecture and uh, anthropology and paleontology, you know, uh, like an Indiana Jones kind of guy, I guess, back in the day. And uh, he said, uh, Mr. Tippett, you are a modern shaman. And I was like, oh, wow, that's nice. <laughs> Nobody's ever called me that before. I've been called a lot, but not that. You know. So that was that was amusing. Es que sí, efectivamente hay 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 mucho de si uno tiene que empezar a definir Mad God que es imposible de definir y eso me parece que es lo brillante de la película que no hay forma de definirla en, en pocas líneas quizá tampoco en muchas me parece que es una experiencia que hay que vivir me parece también que es una película de culto absoluta eh, en cuanto a que son las obsesiones personales de, de, de un autor que además suenan un poco a fluir eh, onírico y, y un poco exorcismo hay algo de esas dos cosas en el medio en la construcción de la película no el carácter episódico de, de las situaciones pero además lo narrado eh, es también, me gustaría, que, me gustaría que hables un poco de, de si hubo algunas influencias puntuales, un descenso al infierno de, de Dante. Hasta... Oh, God, I, I, have, I have so many influences. You know, I started to write them down, and it was just like, I got tired of writing them down. I mean, <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> you know, it was just, you know, I, 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 I just used everything, you know, you know, and the kitchen sink, you know, and, um, and, you know, a lot of it, I, I kind of realized at the end, I, I keep up with uh, world news, you know, you know, daily. And um, so I'm aware, you know, at least with the information that, that you know, we're fed, um, you know, I, I have a worldview. It's actually very similar to Paul's. So, you know, we got, you know, philosophically, we really agreed about a lot of things. But at the end of the day, looking back on that God, you know, there, there was a lot of influences by the... But, and something similar happened to me by, by just letting, you know, this crazy world with these territorial apes running it. And, you know, we have this gift of this beautiful blue planet in the middle of like, you know, <laughs> nothing. And, you know, you're just shitting, you know, in your own house. You know, and you're just, you know, so I, you know, I'm very misanthropic that way. And, you know, I just had, there's no hope for mankind, really. And um, from my point of view. And um, so, yeah, it was, it was, you know, looking back very influential. You know, it was, uh, it was similar, you know, thinking it just occurred to me, you know, a few years ago that it was, or, you know, when I rap mad God, that was very similar to the Dadaists, you know, after uh, World War I, Dada was a uh, art movement that uh, was a reaction to World War I and that insanity. And, you know, I, I, I think it was very similar kind of a thing, you know, where, you know, seeing the world today and its nonsense, you know, was, uh, was, uh, became a very big part of if, if there's such a thing as a subtext in that guy that that was yeah
hay mucha... Sí, muy difícil seguir todo lo que acabas de decir, continuar eso. Eh, la película me parece que es, es un masazo de realismo no realista. <ríe> y habla mucho de la esencia de, de, de los seres vivos, ni siquiera solo de los humanos. Eh, religión, eh, humanidad, eh, filosofía, está todo ahí mezclado. Pero hay una cosa que me parece también muy interesante, y es que no despegas de todo eso la cultura pop. Me parece brillante como en el medio de todo ese fluir vemos a un Alfred Newman, que es la cara conocida de la revista Mad, vemos a los personajes de, a los personajes de Harry Hausen de fondo, y un montón de personajes de tu carrera, y un montón de elementos, un montón de easter eggs o, o elementos ocultos. Eso habla de lo loco que está el Mad God que hizo esto, ¿no? Well, I, I was very influenced by the artist Joseph Cornell. And uh, Cornell made these beautiful boxes. And, um, and his process was, my process was similar to his in a number of ways. And again, this was not through intention. Just looking back, it was like, oh yeah, I just operated a little bit like Cornell. And so he would have like, you know, a dozen boxes that he was working on in his studio. And uh, I would have like four or five setups sometimes at Mad God, you know, and, and working on them. And uh, if I hit an impasse, I would just move on. I would just stop and leave it where it was and move on to the other set until I, I had an idea that I would go back to the other one. And... Um, that that's kind of how Cornell worked as well. And, and he, his process was uh, he would go to uh, antique stores and junk shops and auctions, and he would buy things that interested him, you know, for, for like nothing. And um, so for instance, if he, um, uh, was in a, a a shop and there was a, a yellow stuff taxiderm parakeet um for you know a quarter he would buy it and take it home and he would put it in a box and he he i did essentially the same thing i mean um i have been called an obsessive hoarder you know i just i just accumulate stuff And uh, that, you know, 90% of it showed up in Mad God. So, you know, um, so, uh, yeah, but, but Cornell was very organized. And so he'd be working on something and uh, he'd be stuck and, you know, you know, working on another thing. And then you think, oh, over here, I, I know what to do. And it needs the yellow parakeet. And so he'd go get the yellow parakeet and put it in. It was like, you know, another masterpiece. And yeah, so I operated a lot, a lot like that. Y con todo, todo lo absolutamente monstruoso, eh, en cantidad, eh, de, de, de todos los props, todos la, 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 los elementos utilizados, los decorados construidos, y, y, y que son horas y años de trabajo, porque es una película que te llevó años, ¿qué hiciste con todo ese material? Uh, I kept most of them, you know, definitely all the puppets, and uh, quite a few sets, because the uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York expressed some interest. I did a, a screening for them, Uh, a work in progress, you know, maybe three years ago of Mad God. And th they mentioned they might be interested in putting on a um, exhibition, you know, with, with the thing. So I was very careful to save as much stuff as I could. You know, I had to toss a bunch of stuff out because it was just, you know, I just ran out of space. But, um, you know, hopefully that happens. One thing I, I 
take issue with though is like in art, a lot of articles um is uh you know it's called an experimental film and it was like you know where did that come from you know do they call paintings experimental paintings and um sculptures experimental sculptures or experiment you know it's stupid and I don't know if my if my perception is is accurate, but the the narrative that I've I I see and it might be right, but it might be wrong uh, is that it's a um, it's a fabrication by Hollywood and the Hollywood engine um, in that. Um, an experimental film may, means it won't make any money. So uh, it, it's relegated to this gulag of, <laughs> well, it's not gonna make any money. You know, it's it's cult or it's like, you know, whatever they, they call it. And, um, and, you know, so, you know, in, in my narrative, uh, silent films were the best films. And um, because they had to use their imagination in a way that I believe was ruined by conventional Hollywood studio process. And although, I mean, I love all that stuff and grew up on it, you know, so I'm talking from, you know, not the point of view of a fan, but the point of view uh, 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 as a critic of, of, you know, what I see has happened. And uh, the, the Hollywood system, you know, to um, keep perpetuating itself relied on box office returns and, and stars. And it, it was actually a very brutal and very mean uh, uh, place to work, you know, the way that they treated actors, you know, and, um, you know, everybody was, you know, was, was really pretty brutal. But, you know, they would also, you know, it, it was really rare, rare that they would, you know, write uh, original things which usually ended up as like the B movies, you know, they let people write original things, you know, for that. But, you know, for the big blockbusters, it was very rare to find, you know, like, a, well, they, they would co opt novelists, you know, and make Gone with the Wind or, you know, Moby Dick or whatever. Uh, some, and some of the films, and Moby Dick is like, you know, one of my favorite films, but, I felt that all of these things were in a cage that had been driven by money. And, and it was a prison. It was a prison of, of millions of dollars of you know, treasure and jewels, but you're locked in the prison with all this stuff and you can't use it. You know, and, and so creatively, I believe uh, Hollywood is bankrupt. And not to say that there are, you know, um, you know, brilliant things that, that are produced from time to time, but I would agree with Martin Scorsese, who had an article earlier this year, um, was, he was expressing his, uh, his um, dismay and, and, you know, anger at the term content, you know? It's just used like, you know, pissing or shitting, you know? It's just like, you know, people don't even think about what it means, you know? Content, what the fuck does content mean? You know, it's like a, it's like content, 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 hot air, hot air, hot air, you know? And so, so Scorsese was going, what was the last movie that you can uh, remember that um, that well, what was the last movie that you can really remember? And and his answer was the last one I can really remember that 
that, you know, knocked my socks off was gravity. And it was just something I had never seen before. And hold on, I gotta turn this off. <laughs> hey, I'm doing an interview. I'll call you later. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing it. You're, you're an hour late. That was my producer. <laughs> <laughs> she just woke up, I guess. Anyhow, yeah, you know, that's um, that's what I think. Muy, es muy bueno todo tu 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 lectura y claramente esta es McGonagall es una película que que se se caracteriza por alejarse todo eso y ser también una crítica desde muchos lugares, pero eso se lo dejamos a los críticos. Eh, que saben mucho sobre cine experimental y, y sobre experimentos y experimentaciones, evidentemente. Eh, pero sí tiene una cosa que me parece muy buena, muy fuerte tu película, y me gustaría, para ir cerrando, eh, que cuentes un poco esto. Eh, la película tiene pregnancia. Es muy difícil ver Mad God y no seguir encerrado en ese universo, eh, en ese universo opresivo, duro, eh, terrible en muchos aspectos, pero con, con todos estos, estos guiños, estas cuestiones humorísticas también ahí, eh, es algo que, que, que es muy fuerte. Eh, ¿Cómo resulta la pregnancia para vos como autor? Decías que dejaste de soñar, ¿te sacaste del sistema el universo Mad God definitivamente? Yeah, you know, once it destroyed me, you know, it took me about, um, you know, three months to, to, I mean, it was literally uh, after, after my breakdown, all I could do for, I think I did it for 72 hours. I just, I just stayed up and I just sat on the sofa and I just had the TV going 24-7 and all I could do is just kind of look at it and then like doze off and come back and then eventually was able to uh you know get up and you know walk down the street and eventually walk around the block and then you know eventually you know walk more and more and more and I think the the walking was really the healing that that happened but you know my superpower really is i actually i, I self-diagnosed myself as bipolar at the very end of mad god it was just like i kind of realized wait a minute and i went uh, and, and looked at manic depression and point yeah so i've been seeing therapists and psychiatrists and, and whatnot and and they went like well It certainly makes sense, you know, and it really answered a lot of um, <laughs> questions about my past and my life, you know, and addictions to drugs and alcohol, you know, that, you know, 50% of bipolar people just to just stop the noise, you know, and, and, and there's, it's just it's still to this day, I've learned to manage the noise, uh, but um It's it's a management issue in in my mind. And uh, are you familiar with the term uh, solipsism? Yeah. Sí. So uh, so it's about um, you know you know the only thing that you can completely know is your own mind. You can't know anything else. And um, Atrapado dentro de uno mismo, ¿no? All of us are. You know, whether we know it or not. You know, it, it's yet another prison, but it's a prison that's an entire universe, you know, that you can get lost in. And so, um, you know, uh, the culture, um, you know, manages, you know, us in such a way that that we focus on external object uh, um objectives all the time and um and so you know that you know creates like you know cultural patterns of acceptability that people unconsciously um 
you know, are just are just part of and just live and breathe, you know, like they're, they're like air. And uh, so, you know, I mean, that that's a, you know, that was really a lot of where Mad God was. I just had this universe, you know, that I could, you know, go back and forth and, you know, just travel through time and space. And um, the other aspect of bipolar is I, I rarely get depressed, but um, my manic side is the superpower. I mean, I wake up every morning super excited, you know, to get going on stuff. And then I have a very hard time stopping, you know, at, at the end of the day. And, you know, I'm working on some other things, some writing projects right now. And it's just like every 10 or 15 minutes or every, you know, 20 minutes or half hour, hour, I've, I've got, I've got um, millions of post-its <laughs> and, and crumpled up, you know, <laughs> and they're just, everywhere and it was just like I, you know the ideas are just like stop <laughs> you know shut it off but i can't you know but it's you know it's amusing it's fascinating it's kind of like a hobby <laughs> podemos decir de alguna forma entonces que sí efectivamente mad god es fue y seguirá siendo un, un exorcismo Yeah, if you say so. Yeah, it kind of was. Yeah, definitely. Bien. Y de tantos papelitos verdes, tantos post-its que tenés dando vuelta, ¿cuáles son los que no se arrugaron y, y estás trabajando? ¿Se puede contar alguno de tus futuros proyectos? Well, um... Let's see. So when I was in Locarno for the world premiere of Mad God, um, my wife was in England for, for a number of months. She's English and uh, she's uh, uh, retired. She was the CEO of, of Tippett Studio and uh, now is in retirement. And because she just had enough, you know, it was just the movie, movie racket got so stupid and oppressive, particularly for you know, a CEO. And, um, and so she went back, she was a, you know, a, an art student. And, um, and uh, then when she met me, uh, you know, we got married, I, you know, married her to keep her in the country. And, um, and then she got through me interested in film and editing and producing and all that. Her first job was mixing blood on Piranha. And um, uh, so anyway, she's, she, she's painting. She had a studio over in England for a number of months. And then uh, she was about to come back and I was in Locarno and she was concerned about um, what, uh, you know, she was going to do when she came back because she didn't have a studio and, um, you know, funds are tight these days, you know, we work for the Chinese a lot and they don't pay us anything. But I had a cottage where um, I, I did a lot of more of the, the conceptual experimental type work for Mad God. And um, so I made a painting studio for her in the cottage because I needed to just stop <laughs> and put Mad God behind me. And so I made a pledge to myself that I'm not going to make anything with my hands, you know, for quite some time. So I've taken up um, writing. But before I tell you about that, um, during COVID, I, uh, I came up with an idea for a sequel to Mad God. And the, the name of it is Pequin's Pendicrin. And so I've got three of them. Uh, written as outlines, uh, Pequin's Pendicon, Pendicon, Pequin and the uh, Isle of Insanity, and Pequin and the City of Gold. And it's, 
it's it's more like a Warner Brothers cartoon in a way. It, it's nothing like Mad Guy, but as they say, the canary sings one song. So there's just you know whatever you know every artist needs to find their voice you know and and you're not really an artist until you do find your 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 voice and um and so i you you have to you have to find different voices for different things and this is not a mad god voice this is uh much more playful much more uh inspired by um you know tex avery and um you know, the Popeye movies and that kind of stuff. And um, so I intend to, if, uh, if, you know, there's any interest out there, um, you know, to um, find, uh, you know, um, money to make it. And, you know, we'll hire a crew and try and get it done in two or three years. And, you know, it'll all be stop motion. But there's a, there's a lot of... Uh, new technologies that I, I think will make things look better and um, and um, ultimately be cheaper. I mean, it's all gonna be, you know, stop motion. It's not gonna be any computer graphic stuff, you know. I mean, there might be little bits and, and pieces, but um, none of the main characters will be. And so I spent uh, the entire COVID period um, I wrote the thing, I drew all the storyboards, 800 storyboards, I sculpted all the characters, I shot all the characters against blue screen, I composited them into uh, other backgrounds, you know, uh, and, you know, mostly uh, from online um, free photographs and uh, made all the key art that way. So it's just sitting there waiting to go. You know, and so, um, yeah. And so then, uh, you know, now I've, I've revived, yeah, years ago, uh, you know, one of the things that, that made me, you know, change my course to work on Mad God was that, uh, you know, I could get into any studio I, I wanted to and pitch ideas. And, you know, I was just, I, I had like, you know, a dozen ideas and um but you know after about half a dozen of them i realized you know you know there was absolutely no interest and you know john davison and ed newmark said well that that's because your work is art damaged and you know art movies don't make any money and it was like oh well that's a good point <laughs> And uh, and so yeah, that, that's really kind of what led me to uh, to Mad God. You say, oh, I just have to do it myself. But so now I, I've I've revived. I, I went. I've gone back in uh, to those old ideas and spruced them up. And I'm a much better writer than I was 20 years ago. So uh, and I think I found my voice with that. So I'm I'm, I'm going back. I've spent you know the last better part of after you know I finished all the Pequin stuff just just writing every day you know and I don't have a problem with it. I think I'm channeling Stephen King I, you know if it's if it's any good it remains to be seen but you know I just can't stop getting ideas and once I start writing you know all I I just I see it I just see a scene you know, and so I'll just I'll I'll just write out the scene and then I'll stop, and I'll just I've got tons of notes. The uh, the post its turn into you know then I then I I type them out. You know, it's kind of like a dictionary of like, well, this is about the characters and this is about the mining and this is about the monster and this is about the the weather systems in Siberia and blah 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 blah, and um, and so I've got this dictionary that I, I can pick from. And, uh, and so that, that's what I do. And so I'll, I'll just like, just write a scene and then walk away and, you know, do something else or just like, you know, wait for ideas to come in. I don't seem to have a problem. <laughs> bueno, ahí tenés una nueva llamada. Um... I don't bueno, know. No, yeah. that was a spam risk. And it, it was just like, I don't know, my producer keeps... Well, never mind.
Sí, bueno, tenés, entonces, tenés, tenés un montón de proyectos en los que estás trabajando, tantos que, que no, no tenés control sobre ellos, es, es maravilloso porque es continuar en la mecánica de Mad God, de la cual tenés que escaparte, ¿no? Pero estos tres proyectos que decís, que ojalá encuentren pronto concreción, ¿podrían llegar a ser financiados a través de Kickstarter, la forma en la que pudiste lograr completar un Mad God? I would never do uh, Kickstarter again. You know, I think I hit it at just the right time, but it was too cumbersome, you know, because, you know, in order to make money through that, you had to make all these little tchotchkes and gifty things. And then, you know, the postal bills that I hadn't, you know, thought of were huge. And, and then, it was like diminishing, you know, I made a lot in the beginning and the second one lasts and the third one lasts. And it was like, eh, so I, I would have to find like real money, you know, to, to do, you know, the Piquen material. Bien. Ojalá Piquen encuentre su forma de salir eh, al mundo. Eh, tenemos muchas ganas de ver cómo sigue tu, tu obra como cineasta. En Mad God encontraste una voz, sin lugar a duda. Eh, y, y encontraste también lograste algo que es muy difícil que es hacer una película que, que, que trasciende y que sin lugar a duda dentro de muchos años va a ser eh, recordada y evaluada desde ese lugar desde la, la, la obra de, de un verdadero artista nos da mucho placer poder contar con, con esta charla con vos y esperamos poder tenerte presente en Mar del Plata en el futuro Yeah, well, it was my pleasure. Uh, and yeah, I hopefully, you know, uh, you know, once travel becomes a bit more secure, um, then, um, yeah, hopefully I can make it over one day. Estaría buenísimo, sin lugar a duda. Eh, llegamos hasta aquí. Muchas gracias, eh, Phil, por tu, por tu gran eh, clase, tu gran charla. Un placer pasear por tu filmografía y meternos un poco dentro del universo de Mad God. <laughs> oh, me too. On top of all the other stuff, I'm dyslexic, so. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you. Un gusto, placer, total y absoluto. No te vayas que ahora seguimos charlando y a todas y a todos eh, muchas gracias por habernos acompañado hasta aquí. Eh, no se pierdan Mad God en la 36 sexta edición del Festival de Cine de Mar del Plata. Seguimos en contacto. Muchas gracias.